Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Galecki. Welcome to the 518th Imagine Greater Buffalo program and our 140th YouTube Imagine Buffalo program hosted by our wonderful Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Thank you for joining us today. This program is created by the Center for the Study of Art, Architecture, History, and Nature, and ImagineLifelongLearning.com. Now, before we get started, just a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted and your video turned off. If you have a question or comment, please type it into the chat box and we'll go through them at the end of the presentation. We are recording this program so you can watch it again later on the Downtown Central Library's Facebook page and YouTube channels. And please, we hope you share the link with others. Now, on to our featured speaker. Now, this is a replay from last week where we had some technical difficulties. Rick Falkowski is an author and historian who has been heavily involved in Western New York entertainment for the past 55 years. Starting in the 1960s, he worked as a musician, agent, manager, and promoter for area bands and events. Then in the 1980s, he co-founded the Buffalo Music Awards and the Buffalo Music Hall of Fame. He is also former publisher of Buffalo Backstage Magazine. Currently, Rick is the entertainment coordinator for Tonawanda's Gateway Harbor Concerts. For almost eight years, Rick has offered lectures on Western New York's music scene. And in 2017, he chronicled the area's musical heritage from the 1830s to the 1980s in his book, History of Buffalo Music and Entertainment. Rick Falkowski has also written three books highlighting interesting figures from the area. First Profiles, Volume 1, Historic and Influential People from Buffalo and Western New York, covering the 1800s, and Profiles, Volume 2, which looks at the early 20th century. His latest book, The Spirit of Buffalo Women, Prominent Women Who Called Western New York Their Home. That was just released last month. Rick, welcome back, and let's hear um, all about Buffalo music and entertainment. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here, and it's working today. This is absolutely fantastic. Okay, hi, everybody. Uh, today's presentation is derived from my book, The History of Buffalo Music and Entertainment, and today's talk will really give an overview of the early entertainment in Western New York, beginning all the way back with Canal Street through the advent of rock and roll during the 1950s. As with all my uh, music and history talks, including today's abridged version, I have three goals. I'm going to uh, talk about some things you never heard before. I'm going to bring up some things that you may have forgotten. And third and most importantly, at the end of my talk, after you hear about the accomplishments of people from my area, you're going to be proud to be from Buffalo. Well, we're all proud because the Bills won the other night, but you're also going to be proud after you hear about these other accomplishments. The very first music event in Buffalo was a play in an area called Sandy Town. And uh, this is on the Buffalo waterfront and the play was put on to commemorate the end of the War of 1812. The Eagle Tavern was a stagecoach stop in a hotel at the corner of Main and Court Street, not far from where we are right now, where entertainment was provided by a piano player. Across the street in the current location of the Brisbane building in Lafayette Square, was a building called the theater, where the first live theater performances took place all the way back in the early 1820s. Thursday in the Square concerts were later held at Lafayette Square until they moved to Canal Side, the location of where Sandy Town was. So you could say people in Western New York are going to the same place for entertainment that they did 200 years ago. Well, I'm sure something happened in between. Let's find, try to find out what that was. The city of Buffalo was changed from a quiet village to the busy gateway to the west when the Erie Canal opened in 1825. The area where the Erie Canal entered Lake Erie became known as Canal Street. In addition to the warehouses and freight forwarding companies, this is the place where the Erie barge workers and the Lake Erie sailors came to party and do what they did when they get some time off, indulge in wine, women, and song. Within 10 years, Canal Street became a very dangerous place. 
It was filled with saloons, decadent theaters, and brothels. It became known as the Infected District, and even called it the Barnaby Coast of the United States. However, seedy areas have a history of developing new forms of entertainment. For example, Bourbon Street in New Orleans is credited with where jazz started. Well, Ned Christie was a seasoned singer and comic when he moved to Buffalo all the way back in 1835. He married Harriet Harrington, who was a widow who owned a saloon and dance hall on Canal Street. Her son George and his friends were putting on skits in front of the theater to draw people into the bar. Christie got an idea. He moved them shows inside, and he developed the minstrel show, which really was the predecessor to vaudeville and 20th century comedy. Well, Christie's minstrels ensured their success when they obtained the exclusive rights to premiere the songs of Stephen Foster, considered America's first songwriter. He's the guy that wrote Oh Susanna, Camp Down Races, Way Down Upon a Swanee River, and Old Folks at Home. In fact, Christie is credited with writing Buffalo Gals, Won't You Come Out Tonight. That was written about the women of Canal Street. Now that you know about Canal Street, you know who he was writing about. With the growth of the city, Buffalo wanted to become a cultural area. So in 1835, the Eagle Street Theater, also known as St. James Hall, opened on Eagle and Washington Streets. And the Buffalo Theater opened on Eagle, Washington, and South Division. Uh, today, the theater season begins when? When curtain up starts in September. But in the 1800s, it was different. The theater season was from May until December. Why? Because during the wintertime, you couldn't get the Buffalo. The canal was frozen or Lake Erie was frozen. The Metropolitan Theater opened in 1852 and has seated 2,500 people. That's what the population of Buffalo was just 25 years earlier. It was an elaborate theater. And when the theater was tore down to uh, urban renewal, it was the second oldest theater in the United States. It's always been a tradition in Western New York to have outdoor music areas during the summer. When Frederick Law Olmsted designed the city parks for the city of Buffalo, he created outdoor areas for music. You can see in the slide here, a gazebo overlooked uh, Muir Lake at Delaware Park. There were music spaces at Front Park and the parade later known as Humboldt Park and now Martin Luther King Park was designed for military displays and performances by marching bands. The Pan American Exhibition in 1901 was a World's Fair and it was held in Buffalo. It featured performances by all the top orchestras in the country brass bands in the gazebos, and ethnic music at all the international pavilions. The Shinta's band performed. I found out no relation to the Shinta brothers with Frankie Shinta, but the most popular brass band in the Western New York area during that time was the 74th Regiment Band. They were based out of the Connecticut Street Armory. In fact, they accompanied Lincoln's body during his 1865 funeral procession in Buffalo after his assassination, and they later performed years later at Crystal Beach, which we're gonna mention a little bit later. When the Pan American uh, exhibition ended, people in Western New York missed the excitement of the Midway. Unfortunately, the amusement park rides were sold. They sold them some unknown park in Brooklyn called Coney Island. That gave them a reputation of becoming a great park. Athletic Park, later known as Luna Park, was located at Main and Ferry Streets. And it filled the void, but it couldn't compete with Crystal Beach, Alcott Beach, or Erie Beach. At the turn of the century, that's the turn of the 20th century, the two main styles of entertainment were burlesque and vaudeville. The Palace Burlesque Theater in Shelton Square was the most popular burlesque house, but there were other theaters in other parts of the city. Vaudeville was really more of a PG version of burlesque. It even bordered on a G-rigging to attract women and children for the matinee shows. Michael Shea started out as a saloon owner in the first ward, and he became the king of theaters in Buffalo. He opened Shea's Music Hall in 1892 in the Arcade Building, bringing the English Music Hall entertainment to Buffalo. That was followed by his first vaudeville house at Shea's Garden Theater, which was on Pearl and Niagara Streets. That was followed by, in 1905, Shea's Court Street Theater, uh, you can look how elaborate that was all the way back in 1905. The Hippodrome was built for showing motion pictures in 1914, and that was followed by his showplace theater, Shays Buffalo, which opened in 1926. This was really a fantastic theater. This is where everybody coming to Buffalo wanted to uh, perform. 
In fact, Michael Shea believes that a movie theater transformed people into a different world, and it introduced the customers at the theaters into international destinations. He advocated building regional theaters in different parts of the city. Some of his regional theaters included, as you can see in this slide, the North Park in North Buffalo and Hurdle, Shea Zelmwood, Shea Seneca in South Buffalo, the Bellevue in Niagara Falls, and of course, the Riviera in North Tonawanda. The only downtown theaters that Michael Shea did not operate were the Great Lakes, which later became the Paramount when he purchased it, and the Lafayette on Washington and Broadway, right across from the library where we are today. When it comes to theaters in Buffalo, Michael Shea led the way. However, there were two brothers known as Mitchell and No Mark. No, uh, not the Mark brothers, as you think of, but Mitchell and Momark from Buffalo. They started out as haberdashers, and they obtained an Edisonia, where they ended up showing all of my, uh, Thomas Edison's inventions. That led to opening the first dedicated space in the entire United States for showing motion pictures. Where was this located? Not in New York or Chicago. It was located in the basement of the Ellicott Square building, and it opened all the way back in 1897. There were many, many successful songwriters in Buffalo. But in fact, Hyman Arlock was uh, the son of a uh, Jewish cantor and was expected to father and his, follow in his father's footsteps as cantor at the synagogue. However, he was a pianist and vocalist, and he preferred jazz and bluesy material. His job got a band got a job playing on the Crystal Beach boat. He changed his name to Harold Arlen, one of the most prominent writers of what's called the American Songbook. And uh, he wrote hits such as Over the Rainbow from The Wizard of Oz. Harold Ireland's band was the first to perform at the Crystal Beach Ballroom in 1824. If you look at this, it hit the biggest dance floor in all of North America, holding over 1,500 couples. And they used to pay 10 cents a dance. And they would dance to uh, the top big bands in the world, like the Dorsey Brothers, Woody Herman, Artie Shaw, and Lionel Hampton. Harold Altman ended up managing the entertainment on the Crystal Beach Boat and the Crystal Beach Ballroom. And during the summer and the rest of the year, he ended up uh, opening the Delwood Ballroom at Maine and Utica. However, he didn't have monopoly to uh, big band music in Buffalo. The Chesame on Delaware Avenue also had elaborate shows, and it featured its revolving bar. The Chesame, along with the stage door and the Continental, were actually owned by the Amagon family. That's the same family that owns all the funeral homes in Western New York today. The Town Casino at 681 Main Street booked all the top acts in the country. Just look at what these shows look like. People from Toronto used to come to Buffalo to see all the shows, not the other way around like it is now. And Altman moved the shows to the Glen Casino in Williamsville. That's where Sammy Davis Jr. got his start. There was even three rooms with live bands inside of the Statler and McVans. Okay, was known as the late club in Buffalo. Their last show, as you can see on this uh, poster, started at 2.30 in the morning. And during Prohibition, it was rumored, mind you, I say it was rumored, that liquor from across the Niagara River was distributed from the basement of McVans to speakeasies all around the city. The area in from Washington Street to Michigan and Clinton to William was known as Buffalo's Jazz Triangle. It was here that the top black entertainers locally and from all around the country performed. One of the main places that they worked at was Ann Montgomery's Little Harlem on Michigan Street and also Club Moonglow in the Vendome. Due to segregation, the black entertainers could perform at all the top hotels in the city, but they weren't allowed to stay at the hotels. Most of them stayed at Dan Montgomery's Steakhouse and Hotel on Exchange Street, which I'm told had the best steak sandwiches ever in the city of Buffalo. And to perform at all the downtown theaters and hotels, you had to be a member of the musicians' union. However, African-American musicians were not alone allowed to join the white union, so they formed the Colored Musicians' Union. And the Colored Musicians' Club at the corner of Michigan and Broadway is now a museum dedicated to uh, jazz music in Buffalo. The big band era rushed, uh, ushered in the uh, end of uh, the early Buffalo music and entertainment. On Saturday afternoons, they used to have dances at the Delwood Ballroom at something that was called the High Teen Club. A disc jockey from WEBR named Bob Wells would host these dances. 
And they would draw over 2,000 teenagers that were dancing to the big band music inside of the Delwood Ballroom. This was so, so popular that it became the third most popular radio show in the entire United States. Well, people in other markets started talking about what was happening in Buffalo. And uh, a guy by the name of Ted Horn, he ended up, was from Philadelphia, and he came to Buffalo to observe what was happening at the Delwood Ballroom. And uh, by then, of course, it had changed from big band music to rock and roll music. It went from listening to Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra to listening to the Everly Brothers and Jerry Lee Lewis. And uh, so now on Saturday afternoons, over 2,000 teenagers would come to the Delwood Ballroom and dance to rock and roll music, like you can see there on the right-hand side. Well, Ted Horn went back to Philadelphia, and he was really impressed with the show that he saw in Buffalo. He thought it was a little corny at first with all these kids just dancing to recorded music, but he said that was interesting. So he ended up taking it back to Philadelphia, and instead of having it as a radio show, he started it as a television show. And it was called the Ted Horn Bandstand. Do you get what's going to happen pretty soon? Somebody took uh, Horn's place named Dick Clark. And when Dick Clark took over the show, it became known as American Bandstand. And that's the show that introduced all the baby boomers generation to rock and roll. And it started where? It started right here in Buffalo, New York. So Buffalo had a great history with its big band music, all the great songwriters from Buffalo, all the great uh, nightclubs that we had here. And this ends the early portion of uh, the history with the big band era and ushered in rock and roll music with American Bandstand starting right here in Buffalo. That covers the early history of Buffalo. So any uh, comments out there? Oh, well, very good. Let's, uh, Rick, that was uh, quite a uh, tour de force of uh, Buffalo entertainment uh, history here. And and you're, you nailed it. Um, folks should be and will be that much uh, more prideful uh, with our, with how many things they actually did start here. Uh, I'm going to just make sure that from the library standpoint, the books that I mentioned that you have uh, are at the library. Let's get confirmation of that. And secondly, yes, they are. And secondly, is this uh, uh, what you've just presented, the, the making of a future book for you? Well, this this book is the first book that I released, the talk that I did today. This, you know, this, this is all included in that first book then? Okay. One, one half of it's included in the first book because... You told me to give a whirlwind presentation in 15 minutes about everything that happened in the early history of Buffalo Entertainment. So I did that. I ended it at the beginning of rock and roll. Of course, that's the second half of uh, the history of Buffalo music and entertainment. The first right. half was big band, the brass bands, the Pan American exhibition, all the amusement parks. Then starting in the 1950s, that's when Hound Dog Loren came around and Buffalo became the rock and roll capital with WKBW's 50,000 watts being heard all up and down the east coast of Buffalo. Very good. All right. Well, let's see if we do have any questions, Joy, or... Um, we do. We do have a, a couple questions. First, I want to comment that this was, it was kind of fun going down memory lane and seeing where all the history started. Um, somebody's asking, was the Shinta picture at the at the Ellicott Square? Uh, yes, the pictures of the Shintas was taken inside the Ellicott Square building. And uh, when I do my presentations, I also have a picture of them performing on President McKinley's front porch in Ohio, you know, before he ended up coming to Buffalo. So they had a history with President McKinley, you know, before he was assassinated here at the Pan American Exhibition. Um, another question, let's see, what a rich music and entertainment history Buffalo has. Thank you for sharing all those great stories and photos. This might be completely unrelated, but do you have any history to the origins of the song Buffalo Gales, the song made famous in the film It's a Wonderful Life? Okay, Buffalo Gales, why don't you come out tonight? It's really unknown who really wrote it. 
However, uh, Ned Christie is credited for popularizing that song. In fact, it used to be sung, Buffalo Gals, Can't You Come Out Tonight? In Kansas City, it would be Kansas City Gals, Can't You Come Out Tonight? But the most popular version of that was, of course, the uh, Christie's Minstrels version for which Ned Christie is credited uh, with writing. And in uh, fact, uh, he ended up becoming a very, very rich person from the performances of uh, Christie's Minstrels. And Stephen Foster, who wrote the song, ended up dying penniless. That's why organizations like ASCAP and BMI were formed to protect the composers of songs. So good question. And somebody's asking about the Pine Grill. Okay. Any, the, any the history pine, on pine, that? The Pine Grill go, goes really more into like the second half. Uh, yes, you had uh, the Pine Grill where you had all the early uh, blues and jazz performers here in the city of Buffalo. Everybody from B.B. Uh, King to uh, Muddy Waters, you know, uh, all performed at the Pine Grill. In fact, you still have the Pine Grill reunion in uh, downtown Buffalo. And uh, that was what was called part of the Chitlin circuit. So Buffalo was part of that, and it was part of the legacy of Buffalo. The earlier portion that we talked about, that was the Jazz Triangle, where you had everybody performing at Ann Montgomery's Little Harlem in uh, the Michigan area, right around where the uh, library is today. Okay, someone is asking about um, the photos from Crystal Beach and the Crystal Beach boat. How did you acquire those? I acquired <laughs> them from a guy by the name of William K. William K. Uh, got the rights to a lot of these photos because uh, he wrote a number of books on Crystal Beach. He was the first person to write a whole bunch of books on Crystal Beach. Roseanne Hurst just wrote another book on Crystal Beach, but Stephen K., you know, allowed me, gave me permission to be able to use the photos that he obtained. And he said he got them from the printer who was, uh, I believe, right on Lower Broadway, right near where the uh, library is today. And uh, that person gave uh, K. the rights for the photos. Unfortunately, uh, K. died a couple years ago from uh, cancer. But he leaves his legacy with fantastic books that was written about Crystal Beach. Probably what's five or six different books. Um, and then a question. Got a lot of questions today about the Glen Park Casino. Um, knowing that the casino is gone, how did you um, do that research? Is there anybody still around that you could talk to? Uh, somebody is writing a book right now on uh, Altman about the town casino and uh, the Glen Park Casino. But uh, when I was a kid, I actually used to go to the Glen Park Casino. It was still around when I was little. In fact, it was uh, really a great amusement park, you know, uh, right uh, next to where Glen Falls is today. And uh, yes, of course, it burned down. And uh, it was big because when summertime came, people didn't want to go to downtown Buffalo for the town casino shows. So everybody uh, ended up moving all the entertainment over to the Glen Casino out in Williamsville. That was originally called uh, The Barn, and believe it or not, the uh, town casino was originally called The Town Barn. Now, with the Glen Casino, it also had a history in rock and roll. Just like the Delwood Ballroom had all the big band dances, and then it ended up going into rock and roll, the Glen Casino uh, became a club called The Inferno. And The Inferno was the key <laughs> place for all the top entertainers to perform during the uh, late 1950s and uh, the 1960s. And uh, it ended up burning down in, I believe, 1968. Unfortunately, I never got to go there you know, because I turned uh, 18 in 1969, so it burned down before my time. However, I did play there once. To show you how long ago it was, it was a dance for uh, Rosary Hill College. What's Rosary Hill College today? Now there's Damon University. In fact, after we finished playing, the owner of uh, the Inferno, Glen Casino, said, hey, Blondie, how old are you? And I said, uh, I'm only 15 years old, sir. And he says, well, can you come back when you're 18? Because you have to be 18 to play inside of this place. But then, like I said, it burned down before I be turned 18. But that was an amazing club. There was a subsequent Inferno at 2525 Walden Avenue that was called the Inferno. And people may remember that as also being called Gilligan's and uh, later being called Uncle Sam's. That was also a great rock and roll club 
during that time period, which is really taking us into the second half of the book, which is fine with me. So we've got a question. Can you speak a little of the Harvey and Corky partnership and their influence on music in Buffalo? Harvey and Corky started out by uh, doing concerts with the University of Buffalo. They were both students there and got to the point where they started doing some shows that were really too large for financing by uh, the university. So they wanted to do one show and the university said, no, we can't do it. So what they ended up doing is forming Harvey and Corky Productions when they were still students at the University of Buffalo. And uh, they ended up putting their offices in the Century Theater. We talked about Michael Shea. In fact, Michael Shea also ran the Century Theater on Main Street uh, inside of Buffalo. And uh, the Century was where you had the beginning of all the uh, great concerts in Buffalo. So Harvey and Corky did a real lot for the shows in Buffalo. The other company around that time was uh, Festival Concerts, which was uh, Jerry Nathan. And between uh, Festival and Harvey and Corky, everybody who's anybody performed in Buffalo. Harvey and Corky also had a club called Stage One, and that was located on Main Street, just uh, east of Transit Road. And there they used to bring all the bands before they really got popular. In fact, the police played at Stage One when Harvey and Corky owned it, and there was only like 15 people in the whole place because nobody knew who they were. And there was a band called V2 that opened for the popular band Talos on one of their Monday nights at Stage One. The band was so new that people didn't realize the band was really called U2. And they ended up opening for Talos on that day. In fact, that's a very important day in Buffalo in really international music, because that's the day that John Lennon got assassinated in uh, New York City. So Harvey and Corky did a lot. And unfortunately, with Miramax, some things went the wrong way. And we're not going to talk about them because this is a family show. So we're going to do one more question and then we're going to wrap up. And I just want to remind um, people, because today's kind of a different show where we started earlier, we're ending earlier, and we were, we're taping another show in about 15 minutes. But this recording from today will obviously be on the library's Facebook page. But then next Tuesday at 1230, it will run on Facebook as well. So we'll have it posted at that time. Final question. Can you comment on the significance of Harold Arlen's body of work and his place in Buffalo music history. Harold Ireland, like I said, he was the uh, son of a cantor who had a synagogue, you know, in uh, Buffalo. I believe it was on uh, Michigan Street. And uh, his father wanted him to follow in his footsteps, but he liked jazz music. So when he was like 15 years old, he uh, actually dropped out of Hutch Tech and started playing full time. That was during uh, Prohibition. So you know where he was playing. He was playing at the speakeasies and places in the red light district. When he ended up uh, moving to New York City, he says, I can't be called Hyman Arlock anymore. So he says, I have to get a new name. So he anglicized his first name, Hyman becoming uh, Harold. And he took his parents' first names and last names to become Arlen. And uh, he's one of the main writers of what's called the American Songbook. You know, people like Irving Berlin and... Uh, he was in New York City, and uh, like I said, he wrote uh, the score to The Wizard of Oz, and uh, that's considered one of the greatest musicals, you know, recorded during that time period. And uh, he really put uh, Buffalo on the map. What was interesting is there was another uh, composer from Buffalo called Jack Yellen, and Jack Yellen uh, was asked by Harold Ireland's father please make my son not be a uh, jazz singer, make him uh, become a cantor. Well, Jack Yellen, who wrote Happy Days Are Here Again, said, sorry, uh, cantor, he's going to become one of the best uh, songwriters in the history of American music. And yes, he did. Okay. Dennis, we're going to we're going to wrap it up. I would say we uh, we should be doing that. Uh, Rick. That just a wonderful presentation. You know, looking at that last picture, you see teenagers, a couple thousand you mentioned gathering, and um, and you wonder how I can't picture parents dropping them all off and picking them up, but somehow they managed to make their way around Buffalo and um, and gather at a spot, and you wonder what uh, is replacing that in our uh, current time. So we'll just leave with that thought. Folks, I can't thank you enough for joining us today in the special.
special program, uh, uh, the library for its flexibility, and you, Rick, for uh, yours as well. This went off well. So uh, thank you all. Now, uh, as Joy said, we will uh, stop this presentation and in 15 minutes begin another one with a different link. So don't hang out here. Uh, close it out and then uh, find a new link. And hopefully we'll see you uh, for Clint Brown as he discusses uh, his book, Olmstead, Olmstead's Elmwood. The Rise, Decline, and Renewal of Buffalo's Parkway Neighborhood. Folks, thank you very much. Be well and good day. Thank you, everybody. Hope to, uh, you have a great Christmas. Thanks, Rick.